Hello? Yeah. There we go. All right. To start uh, with, with the last presentation made by Rob first, um, one of the things that struck me um, in, in, in your presentation, and as well as with reading um, Paul's book, was that Truman actually read the speech before, the Seniors of Peace, and called it brilliant and admirable, and yet later seemed to want to deny that he had done so. And I wanted to get your perspectives on that and what you thought the reasons for that might have been. Uh, as I alluded to, in, or I think I mentioned in my presentation, there was a lot of who knew what and how much did they know and when did they know it about this. Um, Truman quite obviously denied that he'd seen it beforehand, um, somewhat after, in the immediate aftermath of the speech, although he had ample opportunity to read it on the train from Washington, D.C. Clement Attlee and the British government also were, oh my goodness, this is a private person, Winston Churchill, delivering, he, he, he's not, this isn't the policy of Her Majesty's government. I think it was simply just simple politics, because as I alluded to again in the presentation, the Soviet Union, the intentions of the Soviet Union were um, b becoming more apparent, but not to the general populace. And I think all governments, all democratically elected governments, have an eye on the next election. Um, and they wanted a plausible deniability to see which way the public would side when Winston Churchill delivered what was a controversial speech. And as I said, Churchill loses the election in 45 because he's perceived as a man of war, not a man of peace, not the right man to lead the peace, comes to Fulton, Missouri, delivers this speech that has bellicose uh, overtones or undertones. Um, and it's, it's better to have a man like that deliver a, a controversial message um, that is, has plausible deniability than to line up with it straight away. And I think, I think Truman is just being a, de a deft politician, as was Attlee. Well, and Paul, in your book, you mentioned that uh, after Harry Hopkins died that uh, Churchill could have had no greater American friend than Truman. Was, was Truman somewhat scapegoated again in that way? I mean, is that an issue here with uh, him being sort of, you know, knowing that the speech was read by Truman and having denied that he did so and then backtracked from it? I, I think I missed a part of your question. Uh, you was, said in your it? book that after Harry Hopkins died that you said that Churchill could not have found a better friend than Harry Truman. And so with that in mind, even though Truman had read the speech before and then plausibly denied that he had, at least tried to, uh, what's your take on that? Well, I, he, I think Truman had to plausibly deny it. Uh, the New York Times and the old uh, appeasement papers, uh, the Chicago Tribune were up in arms, and he had to uh, stroll carefully uh, through the weeds. And I think in, the, in, in New York, uh, he forbade Dean Acheson from hosting Churchill the following week at a uh, State Department affair to sort of distance himself a little bit. But the Kennan memo had come in by then, the long telegram. Truman was getting on board. Dean Acheson was the, I, for me, the, the man behind the, the movement, which became the Truman Doctrine. And uh, so in those years after the war, I, I, I think Churchill, who distrusted Truman, didn't think much of him at Potsdam when he first met him, came very much so to respect him. OK. Um, back to a, an earlier subject on the Dardanelles in Norway. Uh, Michael's laughing there just a little bit. Um, <coughs> Jackie Fisher, Lord Kitchener, Lloyd George liked the plan of Dardanelles, and Prime Minister Asquith gave his approval of it. Michael, you're, you have stated that in your book. Chris, you mentioned and quoted Halifax, who said focusing on Narvik might be sound, quote, from a military point of view, but would have less political effect than clearing Germans out of southern Norway. The politics were there each time in both of those occasions. The strategies, in my view, were quite excellent. Execution, we can argue whether it was correct or not. But the, the way that Churchill was scapegoated survived Norway, but didn't survive the Dardanelles. Can you explain more to the, uh, uh, to, about that to us? Sorry, I missed the last. Could you explain more to us about that, how he might have survived, but why Halifax and then Chamberlain actually supported that strategy? 
of the, of the attack on Narvik and then made him divide his forces and change the strategy so that they went to Trondheim and split forces. Uh, Churchill was very lucky. If you uh, take a look at the, the, um, one of the drafts of his memoirs uh, from the Second World War, uh, he, makes, he goes on at some length about uh, what a disaster it could have been for him politically. And he says, you know, the, the blame, and I don't know how or why, uh, fell on the head of poor Mr. Chamberlain. And Churchill, I think, was very fortunate in that there was a figure there who had served as a sort of lightning rod to deflect the criticism that normally probably would have fallen on Churchill's head. And the uh, Chamberlain had for several months uh, been losing ground or losing credibility, I think, as a war leader, and had, uh, you know, con contrasted very poorly with Churchill's very vigorous, very dynamic leadership early in the war. Churchill was making uh, very uh, inspiring speeches, even as First Lord of the Admiralty in 39-40. And Chamberlain was much more subdued. He was not providing the same sort of... Uh, inspiring qualities that the British people were, were hoping for and were, were starting to look for. And of course, Chamberlain by 1939-40 was tarred with the rush of appeasement. I mean, it was clear that Chamberlain, despite his very good intentions, had just been consistently wrong about Hitler, you know, year after year after year. And his credibility was, was clearly suffering by 1940. And shortly before uh, the, the Norwegian campaign, uh, Chamberlain made a, a, a well-publicized speech in which he says that, uh, you know, Hitler, you know, we are getting stronger here in these islands. We are getting better and better prepared. Hitler should have attacked us before, and by not doing so, he says Hitler has missed the bus. Uh, you know, Hitler's missed his opportunity. And this is one of the things that he was taunted with in the debate over the Norwegian evacuation in May 1940. Uh, you know, Chamberlain comes in to announce that British troops are being pulled out of Norway and that Britain has suffered this really quite humiliating defeat. And he's taunted with, you know, miss the bus, miss the bus. And this is very much sort of the final straw. This is where people begin to realize that Chamberlain just does not have the qualities they are looking for as a war leader. And this is really the only thing that I think saves Churchill, is that he was the only obvious alternative as, as prime minister. He had demonstrated that he had what was required as a war leader at the time. And Chamberlain, yeah, so Chamberlain, uh, well, that, that's probably, I, I, I think that probably okay. sums it up. Michael, did you have anything to add? Well, I think it's very interesting listening to the talks today, um, how much of it does come back to personality and individuals. It's, it's always a question of what is one person going to do in any particular moment. I was fascinated when Paul was talking about how his attitude toward uh, Franklin Roosevelt changed. And, you know, on so many levels, when you're in an academic um, conference on history, they want to pretend that history is all these huge forces and movements and things. And really, I think what we've discovered here today is it made an enormous difference that Winston Churchill was in this world. It, 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 he made that difference, and he, was un he understood that he was making that difference. So when he comes up against particular problems, whether it's the Dardanelles or later in Norway, a lot of it depends on the decision he's going to make, but it also depends on the decisions others are going to make. Chamberlain steps up in 1940 and takes the fall because he thinks it's his duty to do so. In, the in 1915, Asquith evades that responsibility and so do others, and they let Churchill take the fall. But there's something that Churchill said which I think pins this very neatly, and that is in one of his earliest political speeches, he comes out and he very boldly declares, I believe in personality. And I thought, well, well don't all of us, but he meant by that, and he qualified it to say, I believe in personality over politics, over policy. I think it's the determining factor. And it does matter who's right and who's wrong, not only in affairs of the heart and our relationships and in jobs, but it matters, of course, enormously in history because thousands may die as a result or millions may die. 
So I think what we've had here today is a, is a wonderful education in the personality of Winston Churchill. Well, speaking of personalities, we talked about this in preparation for the panel discussion, and I was struck in your book, Michael, about um, what a great role Joe Chamberlain played um, in, in Churchill's early career. Uh, as an example, Neville is mentioned on only three pages of your book, and Joe is mentioned on many. I think you and I talked, and you called him the old titan. And the Chamberlain family and Churchill seems to have been connected. Um, I just wondered if you had uh, put a lot of thought into that, if that realization came to you as you were writing the book, because I frankly was unaware of how much Joe Chamberlain played a role in Churchill's early life. It makes you understand that, that Churchill doesn't just come out of the blue in 1940 and, and happens to do the things that he does. He's, he's been there, he's done that. And when he's up against Neville Chamberlain, the, the question really isn't, who's Neville? He's known Neville since he was a young man. He knew even more his brother, he knew his father. And the, the great battle between young Winston Churchill, who's almost straight out of the gate into the House of Commons and begins picking fights with the old titan, Joe Chamberlain, who was the political boss of Birmingham. Um, for that young man to take on that old man and to contest policy with him was really quite stunning. And the, the two of them fought back and forth for several years until finally there's this extraordinary moment where they, the big election of 1906 is coming up. It's going to shift power from the conservatives to the liberals. And Winston has already jumped to the liberals. But he goes to Joe Chamberlain's house. And the two of them sit down like a couple of generals before a battle on opposing sides and have a little peace moment. They drink some port, they smoke some cigars, they talk to each other, and they're sizing each other up for the coming battle. And as they walk away, I think Chamberlain knew he was going to lose, as he did, and Churchill knew he was going to win, as he did. And it actually was a very defining moment because within a few months of that defeat, Joe would have a stroke and be pretty much taken out of politics and have to turn over the political dynasty of his family to his, his two sons. Neville, when he shows up in the 30s as a powerful figure, uh, Churchill knows him backwards and forwards. And I don't think he's surprised by any of the things he did. It, in fact, it was always Neville who was the, the sort of the lesser son and the person who had failures in his past. And I think it surprised a lot of people that Neville became prime minister. Well, there's an interesting quote in 1902, uh, Austin Chamberlain and Winston Churchill had a conversation, and Winston asked Austin what he wanted to become, and uh, Austin thought about it for a bit and thought, well, the Admiralty uh, ought to be one of the pleasantest offices and the post of First Lord one of the most proud positions that any Englishman could occupy. And Winston was openly disdainful, and Austin never forgot his reaction. Winston poo-pooed it as poor ambition. Just thought that was an interesting take on the two men. Rob, I wanted to ask you about um, Churchill's prescience relative to the United States of Europe. We had David Cameron here this week with our president, President Obama, talking about uh, Europe's, uh, the EU and Britain's participation in it and how it will be going forward. Uh, he wants a different referendum. He wants something to be different than it was. And Churchill has been said to have been wanted to be part of the United States of Europe, but not really in it. What's your perspective on that and how that fits with today's goings on? Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this at dinner last night and it, it, needless to say it's a very fruitful topic and it's certainly something on the minds of, of, of uh, the, the British electorate at the moment as the UK Independence Party seems to be gaining ground a, a, across the country. Um, I, I think Churchill's very pragmatic in his dealings with Europe and in the same way that I think he sees, him, sees Britain and probably himself as some midway part between the US and Europe, um, I don't think he would have been, I think he would have been in favor of, I think the arrangement we have today where uh, British legislation is subject to Brussels is not something Churchill would have ever have considered to be uh, a wise or indeed a, 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 an appropriate move. What, what he actually thought about in concrete terms, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I think as, as, as often with Churchill, he has a good idea and it, the bones take flesh on board uh, as things go on. I think David Cameron, in some sense, at the moment, is grappling with that very consideration. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the demands and the challenges of European integration or the way it is with apparently a British electorate that is pulling away for reasons they're not entirely sure about? So it's, it's not a complex, it's not a, 
a, a subject that can easily be dealt with, and it is a complex one. Um, that's not a terribly erudite answer, but uh, it, it it makes Churchill relevant today, though, as to exactly what's going on, in my view. I, I, think, I, I think it does. I think so, because Winston Churchill knew then that in all probability as Britain's global role diminished, and as the global role of the US grows in Europe after two major conflagrations of necessity grows together, what then is left for the British? Mm -hmm. How will we re-engage with Europe? How will we reinterpret? our role on the global stage. So in a sense, what Cameron is dealing with now is something that Churchill was wrestling with then. I don't think anybody's come up with a completely harmonious uh, answer to that. And, and lastly, before I take questions uh, from the audience, uh, Rob, you gave an eloquent uh, discussion uh, of what happened in the July 1945 election. As I mentioned, Paul, um, I'm not sure you were here when I talked about it, but it brought tears to my eyes. And I wondered, as you were writing your book, um, if you felt the, the strength of emotion that many of us do about how he could have been so unexpectedly and unceremoniously unelected in July 45, did that come across with you as you were writing those passages? It, it did. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I want to say that I was listening in the corner to Rob's address, which was eloquent and elegant. Um, and thinking back to writing that section, I, again, grew up with the story of, you know, my father saying that the Brits threw Winnie out, Paul. Um, but the Gestapo quote and Clementine and Mary had tried to dissuade Churchill from mm -hmm. inserting that in the speech and Colville had tried to dissuade him and he was just hell-bent to make that statement. And, and I thought, uh, and, and Lady Soames said it best, that he had forgotten how to be a politician. And, you know, what did it cost them? Well, well it, elections weren't poll-driven then, but, you know, if it had been close, if, if two or three or four percent of the electorate were put off enough by that remark, that could do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that is tragic in that sense. Mm -hmm. If I can just add, add one little addendum to that, it, it, it seems remarkable that this could have happened. But the, the, one of the paradoxes is that is Churchill's government sponsors the beverage report that imagines a, a better post-war world for Britain. Churchill and the Conservatives have the opportunity to embed this in their manifesto, but do not. And Labour seizes on it. And Labour puts to the British people perhaps one of the most compelling electoral messages you could ever have, which is, if working together we can win a war, what can we achieve by winning a, uh, we can win a peace in the same fashion. And the Conservatives don't have anything to match that. They've got Winston Churchill, emblematic leader, inspirational leader, but it's not enough. And so in many ways it's a terrible shock that Churchill and Conservatives lose, but in a sense it's, it's unsurprising because they, they don't offer, they don't make the most of Churchill. And in fact what polling is going on suggests that what the British people wanted is a Labour government with Churchill as Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. But they don't get the opportunity to do that. And so it's a conundrum when viewed from the US. But Britain at the time, even my mother, who was a girl in the Blitz, talked about Churchill, the wonderful war leader, but the new promise that Labour seemed to offer. Churchill, of course, knew we couldn't afford it. Britain was bankrupt. The things that Labour are promising is grounded in uh, on sand. Coalition was no longer possible. No, exactly. So. I mean, just, if I could add to that, that um, I think it was in March of 44, Churchill gave a speech where he used the expression cradle to grave um, to give the British people new housing, prefabricated housing, uh, national health insurance, um, uh, unemployment in, in insurance. These were things that he had championed with Lloyd George 20 years Absolutely. earlier, um, or 30 and that Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't have touched them like a hot stove, uh, some of the, the, the ideas that Churchill had. But he had a war to fight, and D-Day was coming up, and, and then the, the rest of 1944. And I think just during the election season, those five or six weeks, the, the cabinet came up with an agenda to implement all of this, but they didn't make it public. They, so again, over here, I've always thought of, you know, the, the British people throwing Churchill out and Labour comes in with their radical agenda, but 
uh, much of it was in lockstep with, with the beverage report and w with where Churchill was going mm -hmm. in that regard. Absolutely. All right, do we have some questions from the audience? Jeremy's going to walk around with the microphone, I think. I'm going to start back here in the corner. Oh. Well, it was one of the individuals who I didn't let ask a question earlier, and he already asked it in private. Uh, yeah, my question is for um, Mr. Reed. What is your opinion on the bombing of Germany and basically the ethics of the decision and why you think it needed to be made? That has been getting new and different treatment over the last 25 years or so. Uh, I'm with Churchill. Well, on the one hand, he, he, it's easy to go after him in the sense that he said, I'm going to make Germany bleed and burn, and, and there's, you know, I'm going to bomb every Hun corner of Europe, so that when he started in on his strategy, it, it seems as if it's tainted by his own malevolence, which isn't the case. Uh, he couldn't put an army into Europe in 1941 or two or three or most of 44. The Navy wasn't going to win the war. And so he signed on to air power, which he had his doubts about. At one point, he said uh, much the same about the RAF that, as he did about the Navy. The, that we, 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 first, the, the RAF could deliver victory. Months later, he, he wasn't a, a, a believer that much more in bombing. But it, it sent a message to Stalin, along with the Germans, this was Churchill's second front, that Stalin diminished and uh, poo-pooed. But I mean, that was the best he could do. And he was, at first, going after industrial targets. And in fact, he never, uh, he, the RAF always, in a sense, went after industrial targets until uh, the, the, the targeting was so bad that if you're trying to hit a rail yard in Hamburg with incendiaries, you know that the city's going to burn. Uh, so from the bombings of Berlin and Hamburg and, and, and Dresden is the, the, the big one uh, among certain revisions of history that th this was just an immoral terror bombing and that had Churchill lost, he would have been hung. Well, it's true. He would have been. But not, I don't think, for the, um, the, 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 uh, the same scale of moral offenses that the Nazi criminals perpetuated. That the, the bombing was necessary. Stalin was asking for it. Eisenhower, in the run-up to D-Day, said, we're not going until every rail line, every road, every tunnel, every bridge it leading to and from Normandy is destroyed. So they, they did what they had to do. And I don't think Churchill took any pleasure in it ever. But he was going to do it. And they, they doubled the bombing <clears throat> tonnage-wise 1941 over 1942 and redoubled it in 40, uh, 1941 over 1940 and redoubled it in 42 and redoubled it in 43 and again in 44. And in the last five months of the war, redoubled it again. And what ifs are dangerous in history, but if, if that bombing campaign hadn't taken place, uh, I, I, were the Allies looking at 1946 or 7 or 8? Who, who knows? Did you add something to add? Uh, uh, just, just a quick couple of things. The, the, there's a famous report, and it's called the Butt Report, which is not a terribly uh, salubrious um, title. Uh, conducted by civil servant BUTT, and they find that the, the RAF find that some ridiculous statistic: only five percent of bombs dropped land within ten miles of the target. So they can't really hit anything. And if you take, if you remove moral compunction out of the equation, and you look at this as a total war, a war of annihilation, everyone in Germany is contributing to the German war effort. If everyone's working in factories, producing tanks, killing British or American troops, then killing of civilians in that fashion, if you remove that moral compunction, you've probably got to do that. And there's another amazing statistic that says that in July of 1944, German, in, German tank production reaches its peak somewhere around the same time as the Anglo-American bombing effort reaches its peak. So there's something to be said they're really not hitting very much anyway, and it's not doing a lot of damage industrially, but it's certainly having an impact on German morale. But if you look at the Blitz, does the Blitz boost British morale or does it diminish it? The, the, the bombing campaign is a, is a huge topic all, all on its own. Chris, what, what about you um, in relation to 
Churchill's focus on Bomber Command versus the possible argument that Battle of Atlantic was extended because of that focus. Where, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, one of the opportunity costs of the, the bomber offensive was that there were only so many long-range bomber aircraft to go around. And, you know, as I, I was talking about earlier in my presentation, I mean, one of the fundamental things about Churchill's uh, leadership was that he was not going to lapse into a completely defensive strategy. He was determined to hit back at the Germans and to hit them at every opportunity. And, and Paul talked about this uh, as well. I mean, part of the problem in uh, 1940 uh, for Churchill was that if you want to send your army away from Britain to North Africa to fight the Italians, then you need an insurance plan. And for Churchill, the insurance was the Royal Navy. And he took a lot of the destroyers and frigates and corvettes and small warships that normally would have been guarding the convoys. And he put them on anti-invasion patrols, which meant that for many months, Churchill, of course, was able to send troops out of the country and know that you know, the Germans would have no chance of invading whatsoever. But it came at a cost. And that cost in, in 1940 and early 41 was that uh, Britain suffered absolutely uh, devastating losses to their shipping in the northwestern approaches because the convoys were largely undefended. And this is part of Churchill's absolute determination to take the offensive. And in 1941, 42, uh, Churchill is no fool. He realizes that there are limits to what air power is going to accomplish, but he is determined that he is going to push the Air Force and the bombing campaign as much as possible because it is, in his mind, an offensive activity. And therefore, it is desirable in and of itself. And he is prepared to take risks and make losses and sacrifices in other places in order to achieve the maximum uh, the maximum offensive uh, capability. So when the Royal Navy kept saying, we need aircraft for the war at sea to protect convoys and to help the Navy out, Churchill consistently uh, blocked them and consistently said, no, uh, if we have long-range aircraft that can operate over the mid-Atlantic, uh, I would much rather have them dropping bombs over Germany. And uh, this is part of the reason why in 41, 42, and you know, early into 43, uh, the Battle of the Atlantic is still uh, going very badly for the Allies uh, in many ways, because Churchill is not giving the Navy as much air support as it needs, and the Navy is crying out for this. And Churchill, over and over again, says, no, you're talking about taking aircraft away, and he calls it the one offensive that we are taking against the Germans, and he will not tolerate it. And over and over again, the Navy was told, you know, basically, uh, you will have to make do with what you have. And what it meant was that the Battle of the Atlantic dragged out longer than it probably needed to. And it meant that uh, losses were heavier, but it meant that the, that the air offensive was able to, to ramp up and to increase steadily during this period. But it came at a cost. And uh, unfortunately, Churchill's view of the Battle of the Atlantic was, as long as we don't actually lose the battle, then we're okay. You know, so his, his policy, and he says this very clearly in, I think it was July of 1942, where he says, we have a limited number of aircraft, I know that the U-boat war is a problem, it's going badly, but for now, we are going to take a risk, and we are going to funnel those aircraft into the bomber offensive and hope that we can destroy the German war economy through bombing before the Germans can choke our economy to death through the U-boat campaign. Now, by November of 42, he started to realize that the Britain isn't winning this campaign, and he begins to waver, and he begins to divert some aircraft towards the Battle of the Atlantic. But it was very reluctantly. I think you subscribe to the theory the best defense is, uh, is a good offense. Uh, further questions? Yes, my question is to the panel as a whole. M my uh, understanding of Churchill's life regarding him as a theist or a deist or whatever he was within the Church of England, as, as I understand, as an Episcopalian, is very limited. Uh, I don't see much, if any, information out there as I search for this facet of his life. I was curious if any of you four could shed some information on uh, organized religion or theism uh, within Churchill's life. 
there isn't much there. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a paucity. Of, uh, I, uh, this was eye-opening for me, uh, especially in, in a, now that in the U.S., no politician can begin, end, or give a speech without God being in there front and center. And uh, Churchill, I used the word agnostic. I think atheist might fit the bill. And when his doctor asked him, uh, do you read the Bible? Because he kept a Bible on his bedside table. I think it's still there in Chartwell. He said yes, but uh, just for guidance, if you will, in crafting his speeches. And he took nothing out of it. Not, he took nothing away from it that we would call spiritual. I think he was a deeply spiritual man. He, uh, he was a, a, a Christian in the sense that, that Plato or Socrates or the pre-Christian uh, Platonic philosophers were. But he didn't have much use for the high church of England and the, the prelates at his dinner table. Uh, they weren't. And he believed in free will. and. I majored in philosophy a long time ago, and that, that was fun working that in because finally I got to talk about free will and de determinism, and uh, which I don't I don't know uh, you know whether Sir Martin Gilbert does or not, but I had f fun with it. And uh, he believed in free will, and Hitler did too. And the one who exercised his will most efficiently was going to win that war. That's what Churchill believed. And he did not say prayers. He didn't beseech the Lord. He, he worked in references such as on VE Day, you know, thank God. And then he moved a motion in the house to adjourn to uh, the church next to Westminster to praise God. I mean, he, he meant it. But Roosevelt, on the other hand, and Hopkins and Eisenhower and Marshall, uh, and even Stalin in his own way, were uh, deeply religious. and. Stalin, I think, feared God. I and mean, he had studied in a seminary. But my Winston, as I saw him, was, um, I, th I think he was an atheist. Uh, Other questions? Um, thank you all for being here. Um, Dr. Havers, you said something, uh, I think, that was very interesting, that we crave a leader like Winston Churchill in the modern era. And uh, I love Winston Churchill. Um, uh, I've named my one-year-old son, actually, after Churchill. Um, I think he clearly is the greatest leader of the last 500 years in the true sense of a leader. In the sense that we've become just so negative in society due to the 24-7 media, I think we have all have to guard against becoming cynical, though. And I'm, I'm an eternal optimist myself. And so my question is, do any of you four gentlemen see any current leaders in our country, Great Britain, or for that matter, out there in the world that maybe we're missing just because of media negativity and reporting or because of our seemingly national hang up on ideology? Because Dr. Havers, you also made the great point, the British people would have loved a labor government, but with Churchill at the head, um, just being optimistic, who, who impresses you out there in the world today, in our country, your country, or, or anywhere? I, I, it's probably a, it's a short list, I think. Um, but I, what I would say, and this isn't an, an endorsement, although I, I like the guy, and, I wouldn't, and I'm not comparing him to Churchill, but if you look at, if you look at Boris Johnson, the current mayor of London, um, who may have aspirations to be leader of the Conservative Party, former Conservative MP, He's a bit of a buffoon, um, but he's a smart guy. But in, in, in the, but he's always ever he he's never anyone other than himself. Um, and I think Churchill was only ever himself. And I think politicians these days, because of the twenty four seven media and all the rest of it, and the teams around them, are constantly checking themselves. Who am I going to offend, or what's that going to do to my polls? Boris Johnson doesn't seem to do that. Or if he does, he's terribly poorly advised because he's always making blunders. But if you look at popularity polls in Britain, he's very popular. Um, and I think one of the things about Churchill is very human. Churchill is a very human human being. 
You know, he, he, he likes his drink, and he likes his cigars, and he likes this, that, and the other. And, and he's only ever himself. And I think at some point, I think people respond to genuineness. Um, and, and so many politicians seem so artificial. Uh, and whether there's a way back from that, I don't know. Or whether, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see if Boris Johnson, for all his flaws, for all his gaffes, whether he does make any progress. And, wh and if he does, whether he's going to be any kind of decent leader. But in terms of somebody who is only ever themselves, um, he seems most like Churchill to me. Um, I don't think he's, a, I don't think he's a, a leader of the caliber of Churchill, but in that sense, and that's only a partial answer, but it's probably all I've got, I'm afraid. Boris Johnson reminds me of, the, he, I think he's the Chris Christie of England. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> I find that interesting because Boris and I worked together at the uh, Daily Telegraph, and I, I liked him when I knew him when he was just an ordinary journalist, but he reminds me of something that is a, um, common with Churchill and we don't have in many politicians today, and that is a reader, a thinker, a writer. We need people who read, uh, not who farm that out to someone else. We need people who can write, not farm that out to someone else. We need people who can sit and think for a while before they do something. And we, Boris was a writer for The Telegraph, he was a writer for The Spectator, he edited that. He's a reader, he's a thinker, uh, he's a writer. And those qualities now, most politicians, they're so busy campaigning, they don't have time for those things. But you, you don't want the, the pinheaded intellectual, I suppose, because they're not always good working with crowds. But you do need someone who takes seriously those qualities that Churchill always did of, of pondering about his actions and putting them in the place of time and history. When we were talking about his religion, I just want to add this. There's a lovely phrase he uses in my early life, and he uses it repeatedly to describe his escape from the Boers. He says, the stars in their courses guided my steps. And by that, I think his faith was in destiny. You can't grow up at Blenheim Palace without having a sense of destiny and of how it works. And whether he attached that to a god or whatever, he did have that sense that he was part of a historical pageant, if you will, or a saga, and that he had a place in a certain destiny. And he definitely had faith in that. I think that faith sustained him in all of these various periods where he was out of power, out of favor. I just wanted to ask if your son is named Winston. Is he a member of the society yet? <laughs> Elijah Churchill Martin. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my question probably falls to Professor Bell, but uh, to, to go back to Churchill's time at the Admiralty in 1914, could you comment briefly on the two other more the two other controversial problems he had? One was the um, the escape of the Gobin, and the other was the uh, his sending the Royal Naval Division to Antwerp. Okay. Um the escape of the Gobin uh, was an interesting incident in that, uh, you know, this, this is something that did help push the Turks towards the war. And, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the, you know, what, what strikes me as interesting about this episode is that Churchill, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, this tendency to interfere. And this is, you know, uh, what, uh, what I was, I think, trying to imply earlier was that, you know, Churchill interfered and that was his job. I mean, he was proud of it, he was happy to do it, and we're probably, for the most part, fortunate that he did. But um, the, the difficulty that Churchill had was that there was interfering on big issues and big questions where his strategic judgment tended to be very good. I mean, he was somebody in 1914, and you know, one of the only people other than Kitchener in the Liberal cabinet who really understood war and international politics and how all the different pieces fit together and had this sort of intuitive grasp of, of what the options were and what the consequences would be of certain actions. And on the big questions, Churchill's judgment was always consistently, I think, very, very good. The problem was that Churchill also tended to reach down into the weeds quite often, and he was much less successful when it came to trying to micromanage uh, the forces under his control. When he left it to sort of mapping out the big picture, uh, I, I can't think offhand of any instance in either war where his judgment was really fundamentally off. When he started to get into this sort of micromanaging process, you know, Churchill, you know, he 
he, you know, he flew aircraft at the time. He went on submarines, but he wasn't trained as a naval engineer. He wasn't trained even as a naval officer. So there were limits to how much he understood about the, the nuts and bolts of how the Navy actually worked. And this is where Churchill could get himself into trouble, when he wanted forces to do things that were just not feasible, not practical. And this is what drove his his subordinates uh, insane at times, was that he did insist on trying to get in and, and direct things at a very uh, low level. And with the Goobin, this is a very good example of where Churchill is so involved and is, that he, he gets into actually drafting operational orders that are sent out uh, from the Admiralty to commanders at sea. And this is a big part of what goes wrong with, with the Goban in that it, you know, the, 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 the careless wording of the order, uh, which, you know, is amazing given how precise Churchill was with the English language. In this case, it was just badly worded, and this gave uh, the commander on the spot uh, uncertainty as to what he was really supposed to be doing. So it, it certainly did contribute to that. And then uh, you asked about the Royal Naval... Yeah, uh, this this is a good example, I think, of uh, again Churchill not knowing his boundaries, and this is something that uh, I think every c uh, cabinet colleague of Churchill that he ever had, uh, certainly before he became prime minister, would complain that one of the problems with Winston was that he insisted on not just running his own department, but on trying to run everybody else's as well. And when Lloyd George brought him back into the cabinet in 1917 as Minister of Munitions, this was one of the conditions that uh, Lloyd George himself really insisted upon, is that Winston could not meddle in anything. You know, he had to keep his head down and not offend or alienate anybody in the war cabinet. So this is part of the problem with Churchill, I think, in 1914, in that he, he wants to direct and control forces. He wants to have options and resources for the Admiralty in order to be able to take opportunities when they arise and to, you know, uh, to, to, to exploit his creative flair. And when the war begins, he is very quick to try to use Admiralty air forces and Admiralty troops uh, in roles that they were never really designed for and intended for. Uh, and he thinks he's doing it, and he is doing it to be helpful. You know, he thinks, you know, if, if we need to be involved in Belgium and to take care of some particular German threat, and the only spare troops that are available are the Naval Division, then, you know, he's more than happy to send them off and do things that really are, are sort of beyond the parameters of what the First Lord of the Admiralty is supposed to do. And he gets, you know, I mean, and it, this is a good case of sort of thinking outside the box and being resilient and flexible, uh, but it doesn't work. And the troops are, are captured, and it ends up going very badly. But it is, you know, very typical of Churchill trying to be flexible, to his willingness and his ability to improvise. That again, you know, even though it didn't work, you know, in many ways, I think it still reflects very well on him. I, I did remind Chris last night at dinner that the last line of his epilogue was that Britain was very lucky to have had Churchill as head of its navy for so long as it did, um, and I think that. History has proven that to be true, despite the claims that he interfered too much. Are there any other questions? Uh, this is uh, for Dr. Havers and Dr. Sheldon. Um, I'm going to borrow a phrase of my wife, who is an English teacher, uh, to ask you to compare and contrast uh, policy, personality, and leadership style uh, between uh, Prime Minister Churchill and Prime Minister Thatcher. It's interesting because of the, the, uh, the importance of, of the concept of the empire. It's the driving force behind Churchill. He's, he's a child of the Victorian period when the empire meant something. It, it means something to him throughout most of his life. And he constantly refers to the war effort in the Second World War as being on behalf of the empire. What's, you, what's interesting about Margaret Thatcher is she's the last attempt to grasp what remained of the empire, not as a, necessarily a physical possession, but as more of a kind of mental state that, that Britain was Great Britain, that it was not a small piece of the European Union. And so in, in as much as she strove to make Britain relevant in the 20th century, 
and perhaps even into the 21st century. She was carrying on to that extent the work that, that Churchill saw. I think it was interesting what Rob said about Churchill's ultimate significance being really about us, about America. I think the war that he won or helped to win was a war really that was for us because the, the British almost immediately under labor began retreating and retreated in, from the Great Britain into the Little Britain. And that Little Britain has gotten smaller all along. Whereas the United States and its influence perhaps has gotten too large, too great. We can't manage it anymore. But our freedom to do that and our ability to do that was largely shaped by what Winston Churchill did in Great Britain. And Margaret Thatcher took one last stab at it. And what she did in the Falklands was amazing to send those forces 8,000 miles from, from home to try to fight a, a war, uh, again, a kind of colonial war, but nevertheless an attempt to say we are still relevant. Ultimately, I think she failed, but we still live in Winston Churchill's world. Any other questions? Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'll just I'll th throw my two cents or, or, or two pennies worth for my uh, English side. Um, I, I think I think the notion that that Churchill is embraced here is in in part because of that because the, the the Second World War propels the United States to a whole new level, but for Britain it marks the end of that level and it's been a decline ever since. Um, Margaret Thatcher does arrest that decline. Margaret Thatcher. It, Margaret Thatcher and, and, and Winston Churchill are two of my political heroes. Um, when you look at what Thatcher achieved when she achieved it, she didn't. She wasn't born at Blenheim with all that in, there were that inspiration around her. She came from a very humble background, and although I wasn't a great fan of that recent movie, The Iron Lady, for its portrayal of her, what it did capture quite well was how. She faced the class system, she faced sexism, she faced her own party, she faced the Argentinians, she faced, she faced everyone and fought them and won in large part. The world, she remade Britain in a way that Churchill didn't remake Britain. He, he saved Britain, but he didn't remake it. Um, Margaret Thatcher remade Britain, whether it was quite the world she wanted or it turned out quite the way she did. Uh, I'm not sure. She, she claimed Churchill as one of her heroes, um, and she was inspired by him. But uh, how, how they went about it and in the worlds they lived in were, were, were very different. But um, yeah. I think we have two more questions. Just um, a couple of quick things um, on Churchill and religion, which I agree is a somewhat unexplored subject. Um, at our conference in Washington this fall, Andrew Roberts is going to do a paper on Churchill and religion, which I think will you know, touch on a lot of those topics. And then, um, so David Canadine has done a radio series called Churchill's Other Lives, one segment of which is about Churchill and religion. That'll be on our website probably in a couple of months. And then just on bombing policy, um, Martin Gilbert some years ago did a wonderful paper um, the title of which was Churchill and Bombing Policy, and really explores those issues about German industrial production, how it was affected. Um, just as a, as a marker, um, Churchill certainly was not immune to um, moral considerations t towards the end of the war. As, as you all know, he, he wrote a note to uh, I don't know, was the chief of bomber command, and the question was, are we beasts? So he wasn't um, unaware of that. Um, the growth of German industrial production, despite strategic bombing, you know, had a lot to do with Albert Speer's you know, genius at industrial organization and also five million slave laborers who were working in Germany. So that's, that um, piece by Martin is worth reading and it's, it's on our website. Thank you, Lee. And uh, I sort of think it's fitting that the last question comes from the students here. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Havers, my question is for you. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's coincidence that Mr. Churchill, during his time uh, as a leader uh, in w World War II, as well as with the Iron Curtain speech, uh, was able to, as Mr. Reed said, he ha was amazing at judgment through uh, with people as he did with Hitler, uh, Stalin, things like that. Do you think that, uh, and as, as uh, Lady Sohn said, uh, Churchill had forgotten how to be a politician from being a leader. Do you think 
that with the Iron Curtain speech and him being correct about that Iron Curtain, Stalin, uh, with, with the Cold War and things like that, do you think that propelled him and do you think that was in the mi uh, minds of the British people in a positive way to reelect him in 1951? Um, I, I, no, I actually don't think so. I, I think. I think part of Churchill's re-election, and it was a narrow win in 51, was because Labour was exhausted and they didn't have any new policies. And, and curiously, and I think I may have mentioned this, when Churchill comes into power that, that in 51, that, that the narrowness of, of the electoral win that, that he, the Conservatives achieve, he doesn't feel as though he has a sufficient mandate to really reverse a lot of what Labour put in, even though he was implacably opposed to it at the time. And as I think Paul mentioned earlier, Churchill had a sense that the British people deserve some reward for two world sacrifice and two world wars. If it was the welfare state and all of that implied, he wasn't a terrible fan of it, but that's what they wanted, then, all right, that's what they've got, and I don't feel I've got a, a massive mandate for that. Um, so I think part of it is the weakness of, of the Labour Party in 51 that brings Churchill back. Um, and th th there may have been a, a, a sort of a sense of... Um, Maybe now isn't a time for Churchill because Korean War is coming on, the Cold War is becoming a little warmer. Uh, maybe now it is time for a man of war and not a man of peace or a man who can command authority and respect on the, on the highest stage. Um, Churchill, Churchill seems remarkably prescient. If you read his history of the World War II, he's incredibly prescient. Um, he, he wasn't always as accurate at the time, um, uh, but he, he certainly has a sixth sense about threats and imp impending threats. Um, and and Churchill, Churchill's wrong a lot of the time, but as, as somebody said earlier, it really is a case of cometh the hour, cometh the man. There could no, Churchill at any other time in British history was probably not a great prime minister or a great leader. Some of his, his failures are testimony to that. But May 10th, 1940, when he becomes prime minister, there is no other individual who can reverse the course of history that Winston Churchill um, does um, and for that I think we should all be very grateful. Here, here, and <laughs> well, on behalf of the Churchill Society of New Orleans, I want to thank all of our speakers and the presentations you've made. They were wonderful and inspiring, as I thought they would be and predicted they would be. So I was a little bit prescient myself. And uh, thank you so much for coming. I'd like another round of applause and thank the, the uh, World War II Museum for having us yet again. We want to thank you, Greg, our distinguished panelist, and you, our audience, for adding immensely to the day's program with your questions. This has been another wonderful event that we're grateful to our partners at the Churchill Society and the Churchill Center. Also, we want to thank our veterans, and also thanks to Ms. Tina Flaherty and her support for the students at Copiah Lincoln College. It's great to see the next generation of Churchillians here who will hopefully carry what they've learned here today out into the world, into their promising lives and careers. And so now, as I adjourn this symposium, please everyone join me and the speakers out in the American sector where we will enjoy our closing reception. The store is still open on the red carpet, so take this opportunity to get your books, get them signed, and continue your conversations with our remarkable panel. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>